everyone, today we're going to talk about modern poetry, but before we get started, let me just tell you something briefly before we say anything. Uh, I know how much you're struggling, I know things are difficult for you and for me, by the way, for everyone in this coronavirus time, we're all stuck at home, uh, we can work properly, I know you're not following up with your classes properly, but we'll try to help each other. So I thought that instead of creating another PowerPoint presentation for you, I thought about making a video, uploading it on YouTube, so maybe it's just somehow interesting, um, it might capture your attention, uh, plus I don't want you to lose interest in poetry. I don't want you to get bored as well. And I thought that maybe uploading it on YouTube would so maybe help someone somewhere in the world who's studying poetry and is looking for a material or some resources, maybe this video would be helpful or useful for anyone. So anyway, um, I hope this video will be useful for you. Um, I hope it contains enough information um, and definitely I'll be waiting for your questions. Whenever you feel like asking, just go ahead. Um, I'll answer everything. Uh, I just don't want you to be worried. Um, today's class uh, is about modern poetry. It's supposed to be interesting, totally different from everything that we've covered before. Okay, so last time we were talking about Victorian poetry and you've seen the features of Victorian poetry. We studied some Victorian poets and we've seen their poems, how interesting they were and how somehow rebellious Okay, today we're looking at a very different genre in poetry, modern poetry. Whenever you say the word modern, it's like, oh my God, you have to remember that there was war and uh, a lot of changes in society and science and technology and almost everything that you could ever think of. So let's just get started from the very early beginning. The modern poetry started in the late 19th century up till the middle of the 20th century. And a lot has been going on in these periods from the late 19th century up till the 20th century. So without even saying anything about the late 19th century, but take a look, just take a look at the World War I and World War II. These two wars were very, very uh, miserable, uh, such a very painful experience for the people who went to war. Um, it destroyed everyone's lives, whether they were soldiers or their families or even just normal citizens. All around the world, World War I and World War II destroyed everybody's lives. Especially World War I was much more effective than World War II. It brought more destruction to the world because it was the first thing that happened and people uh, had always been living, thinking about uh, maybe romantic ideas, romanticized things, um, had very strong faith, they were certain about things, uh, as you've seen in the Victorian maybe period and, and, and even the periods much before that. But by the beginning or the end of the war, people started changing completely. They started questioning every single thing. They were very uncertain about their religion. They were uncertain about things around them that they usually took for granted. So let alone poets, writers, philosophers, thinkers, dramatists, and so on. If normal people and citizens were very unsure of themselves, they were shattered and uh, destroyed. They were angry, rebellious, and they hated their lives or had many existential or suicidal thoughts, for example. What about the poets? The people who usually you create art, people who are very talented in expressing their feelings, people who are very talented in reflecting reality and so on. So definitely poets, writers, and all of those artists, they took this chance in order to create a new movement, which is known as the modernist movement, the modern period. All right, um, we're going just only to focus on poetry. Okay, so here are the poets 
who are the modernist poets, they thought that, okay, so now this is a modern period. After the wars, things have been changing. Uh, a lot has been going on in the world, not just only wars. There were also, there was imperialism, which means that countries were trying to expand colonization, countries taking over other countries having colonies, then colonies gaining their independence. There was uh, technological change. There was much more scientific discovery. Uh, there were a lot of things taking place in that period. So definitely poets thought that, okay, so poetry has to change as well. Style of writing must change as well. So po modern poets thought that, okay, right now, we are not going to follow any rules in poetry, in conventional poetry. Remember, in each period, in the Romantic period, 16th century, metaphysical, Victorian, they had some rules that they had to follow. And they had a certain structure or a writing style or maybe a meter and a rhyme scheme. But in the modern period, they all destroyed these rules and conventions. They wanted to express themselves. The modernist poets thought about expressing their emotions freely without any kind of restrictions because they've had enough restrictions and rules and laws that they had to abide by in the last periods. And what happened? It all went in vain. It was all needless and futile since the war came and it destroyed everything. So what's the use of rules and laws now? So they decided to reflect what was taking place in reality. Reality was fragmented. It was chaotic. Things were hectic people going out of control, people losing their minds, uh, things were changing drastically. So poetry reflected this fragmentation, this chaos that was taking place in the world. Okay, so most important is that they thought about freedom. That was one of the most important features that actually make modernism very different than any other uh from any other genre freedom freedom in rhyming freedom in the structure and the style and everything so they all decided to have a free verse you wouldn't find rhyming in their poems even though some poets like added uh like maybe a couple of rhyming words however they don't depend uh, completely on a very independent, uh, very uh, regular rhyme scheme that wasn't existent in their poetry. You'll also find that they actually were influenced or inspired by mythology. Some poets, like T.S. Eliot, refer to some myth. Also, there were many religions to religion because even though people started losing faith, they still had some kind of hope that something would bring the world back into harmony. Something would fix all of these uh, problems and would mend them. So it, will, it, it might have been religion or also literature. A lot of poets wrote poems thinking that, okay, so maybe we'll find refuge and solution in literature. Maybe literature is what will bring the world back on its feet and things will start to become better. Maybe we'll raise awareness because, as we said before, that poets believed that they were prophets and they had to deliver a message to people. There is also a very important feature that I have to talk to you about it, and it's imagism. And imagism means that these modernist poets decided to write a couple of poems, okay, that had no imagery at all. You'll barely find punctuation, and it's just a, a poem, okay, with no images or punctuation. But whenever you read this poem, you'll find that, wow, I can actually see something in front of me i can imagine something there is an actual image without actually looking at a, a painting or a portrait or even a picture no they believe that words should be expressive enough diction can actually evoke pictures in somebody's mind and that that's how they believe that words were very powerful more than images could ever be so you'll definitely find a lot of imagist uh, poets one of them who is very, very, very famous and very well known is 
um, Ezra Pound. All right, and you'll you'll always find that their poems were very short, very short, and to the point. They don't just go on talking and talking and narrating stuff and so on, like the romantics and the metaphysical poets and and so on and so forth. All right, you also find in their poems, the modernist poets, you find that there is a stream of consciousness, and what does this mean? It means that they are talking about their inner emotions. They're expressing themselves, they're expressing what is actually going on in their minds, all right? So it's like they are reflecting things that are real. They're reflecting reality, the truth that is taking place. They are not living uh, somewhere else. They are on earth witnessing all of these troubles and the problems that have been going on and now it's time to express it or put it into a work of art and let everybody learn about it. So, yes, this is basically everything about modernism that you you would like to know for now because it's just an introduction for poetry course. Um, so you don't really need to know a lot. Uh, the most important thing is to, to know the themes, the major themes that appear in most of the modernist poets' poems You'll find a miscommunication among people. Even though there is language, people don't really understand each other. There is like a wide gap between people, whether they were from the same social class or even from different social classes. It was even much worse for, for people who were very poor and suffered from poverty. So there was lack of understanding, there was miscommunication, there was alienation, and alienation means that people felt like they were so different from each other, they were so different from everything around them, they can no longer identify with themselves or anything else in the world. Uh, you'll find also the theme of isolation, which means that people started like to isolate themselves. Uh, they were very afraid from... Um, connecting with others, um, the gap starts to widen again and again. So yes, basically uh, their, life, uh, their lives were uh, fragmented, <clears throat> chaotic, there is no stability, there is no certainty, everything is questionable, there, there were a lot of existential uh, crises, a lot of existential uh, problems and thoughts, um, the human mind and the people and the generations started changing, thinking differently, um, favoring intellect over emotions. Yes, and I think that's all about the features of uh, the modern um, poetry. Oh, but, oh my God, I, I was going to forget. So let's, let me just tell you some of the famous modernist poets. We of course, T.S. Eliot. You can never do modern poetry with, without studying T.S. Eliot. Uh, the Wasteland and the Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, written by T.S. Eliot, are two excellent examples that reflect the modern period. You, you'll, you'll never actually want to resort to something else uh, to know something about modern poetry if you read these two poems. Um, also, we have Robert Frost, a very intellectual and amazing modernist poet. Um, there is Emily Dickinson, Sylvia Plath, there is also a poet by the name Sarah Teasdale, um, there is also Hilda Doolittle, um, Carlos William Carlos, E.E. E. Cummings, a lot of poets that you can look up in the, on the internet and um, read their poems and see how different uh, each one talks about something, how they talk differently about maybe the same thing. But at the end of the day, we understand that they are reflecting something real. They are reflecting a dilemma, a catastrophe that happened in the modern period. Um, the human brain and how it was affected by the war and the, the trenches and and so on. Uh, by the way, we can refer to some of the poets, like maybe maybe the war poets, like uh, Rob Robert Brooke and Siegfried Sassoon, like we can call them, and Wil Wilfred Owen, by the way, we can call them um, 
confessional poets. Confessional poetry is also a genre of poetry that emerged in the modern period, and uh, it was just confessional. It comes from the word confession, which means that people were talking, uh, confessing, or like talking about their emotions, talking about their personal experiences. So yeah, this happened in war poetry. People were talking about the um, the problems that they faced, the painful experience of the war, the trenches, the shell shock, how they never actually healed, nor them, neither them nor their families from um, the aftermath of the war. Um, so they had to put this into uh, a work of art. And let's not forget that literature is a refuge. It's a means of... Uh, uh, like um, letting out your emotions, your feelings, your worries and fears into words. And mm, if it's poetry, then it, it means that you're a very talented person and very aesthetic in your choice of uh, expressing your emotions. Um, all right, I think that's all for modern poetry. Mm, this is more than enough for you to know. Okay, right now I've prepared a little thing for you. Just I would like you to take a look at in order to know how to analyze modern poems, uh, understand the major themes. Um, we're going to read three poems together right now, and I hope you enjoy them. And I'll be waiting for all of your questions, um, and definitely I'll be answering them. I hope you enjoyed this read video. I don't know if it's boring for you or not, but I hope you like modern poetry because it's actually worth studying. Thank you everyone, bye! Okay everyone, so right now we're going to take a look at some poems, all right, in the modern age, and we're going to try to analyze them together. But first of all, let me tell you who these people in the pictures are. The first one on the left is T.S. Eliot, the one in the middle is Robert Frost, and the last one is Walt Whitman. These were three poets who were very famous and very remarkable figures in the modern period. All right, let's start with the first poem by Wallace Stevens, and the poem is called Of Modern Poetry. Let's try and read it together. The poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice it has not always had to find. The scene was set. It repeated what was in the script. Then the theater was changed to something else. Its past was a souvenir. It has to be living to learn the speech of the place. It has to face the men of the time and to meet the women of the time. It has to think about war and it has to find what will suffice. It has to construct a new stage. It has to be on that stage. And, like an insatiable actor, slowly and with meditation, speak words that in the ear, in the delicatest ear of the mind, repeat exactly that which it wants to hear at the sound of which an invisible audience listens, not to the play, but to itself, expressed in an emotion as of two people, as of two emotions becoming one. The actor is a metaphysician in the dark, twanging an instrument, twanging a wiry string that gives sounds passing through sudden brightnesses, wholly containing the mind below which it cannot descend, beyond which it has no will to rise. It must be the finding of a satisfaction, and may be a man skating, a woman dancing, a woman calming. The poem of the act of the mind All right, I hope you enjoyed this simple recitation of this poem. Let's just delve deeper a little bit into the poem. Well, this is written by Wallace Stevens, and he was a very famous American poet. And what's really interesting about this poem is the fact that it's actually written about modern poetry. I mean, look at the title. It's titled of modern poetry so you expect that definitely it will discuss things about the modern age or modern poetry or the modern writing of poetry in general 
Okay, all right, and it also highlights the traditional ways of writing poetry, which should be evolved by the development of time. So the main thing that the poem here is talking about is how this man, well, Stevens, was calling for developing poetry because time is passing. We can never be stuck in the Victorian period, in the Romantic period, or even the 16th century. No, things change, things evolve, people evolve, even the writing style of people could still change and develop. That's why Wallace Stevens was calling for this asking people or poets of that time to like break free from the shackles or restrictions and the guidelines and the rules that the poets have been following since ages. He wanted people to start expressing themselves more, following their own intuitions, not following any rules or rhyme schemes or even meter. This is modern poetry. This is like a new style of poetry that should emerge, that should be different, that should be special only made for this period now if you look at the themes you'll find that there is creativity talking about literature modernism in general all right so here the poet evaluates the simplicity and satisfaction of poetry written in the past he does not deny the fact that poetry written in the past was very good or even excellent however he's asking for a change because as we said before, people cannot be stuck in the past. No, things change. And as we mentioned before at the beginning, that in the modern period, things starting changing drastically, especially after World War I. Things that are not the same anymore. People's mentalities have changed, their perspectives, their inner selves. So everything around them is changing as well. How come the writing or poetry or even the narratives would still remain the same? So in other words, we can say that here the poet has very revolutionary ideas regarding poetry. And modern age was all about rebellion and revolutions as well as everything else that was taking place in the world. When we take a look at the analysis, you'll realize that it's a free verse poem. And you'll find a lot of personifications there in this poem, because uh, without even looking at the words uh, written or the diction, we know that the poet here is talking about poetry. The poet here is personifying poetry. It's personified first as an actor, then as a metaphysician in the dark, who is also a musician. And this is to signify that poetry is considered a person that has an independent personality and is prone to change. Twanging is an example of onomatopoeia. You know what is onomatopoeia? Okay, it's the sound of things like, um, like here, the word twanging. This choice of literary device creates sound in the poem that could be heard, and this highlights the influence of poetry on its readers or listeners, or both of them at the same time. Because you remember what I mentioned before, that poetry should be appealing to the ears, because uh, it's different from uh, prose, it's different. This is verse, this is supposed to be something that when people hear, they're su it's supposed to be appealing to them or captures their attention in one way. And to capture people's attention, you don't have to be rhyming. And that's what makes modern poetry very special. Let's go on. The image, like an insatiable actor, here this is a simile, and it's a comparison of poetry to a greedy performer. And this simile here is added actually to the personified image of the modern poetry as like an actor or a metaphysician and a musician. And why is that? This is to emphasize the fact that poetry should not be taken for granted or even considered abstract. However, it has an identity of its own which could take various shapes and forms like any normal human being. Also, be careful, the entire poem is an extended metaphor for the decline of religion and traditional values and a call for the emergence of modernist techniques in composing poetry. You can try and find more literary and sound devices in the poem. I'm sure you'll find a lot of them. So go back to the poem and try to take some notes. Now let's take a look at another poem written by 
um, the wonderful, the intellectual and amazing T.S. Eliot. It's morning at the window. They are rattling breakfast plates in basement kitchens. And along the trampled edges of the street, I'm aware of the damp souls of housemates sprouting despotently at area gates. The brown waves of fog toss up to me twisted faces from the bottom of the street and tear from a passer by with muddy skirts a nameless smile that hovers in the air and vanishes along the level of the roofs. This is such a very expre expressive poem written by T.S. Eliot in autumn 1914. This is shortly after the outbreak of World War I. So you can literally guess what he was talking about and you can also detect the tone, how melancholic, nostalgic, sad and depressed it seems to be. The poem here describes the speaker's impressions about the streets outside as he peers from the window. And the poem presents a series of miniature observations about modern urban life. The sound of dirty plates being rattled in basement kitchens, the housemaids hanging around outside the properties where they are employed, the brown fog, too. Now here the poem is strongly influenced by the French poets whom Eliot had been reading for, and these French poets were Charles Baudelaire and Jules Laforgue. Baudelaire in particular had showed Eliot how the modern city would be a fitting subject for the poet. As Eliot later recorded in his essay, Baudelaire, the key, Eliot said, was to elevate ordinary everyday details to a higher pitch, to bring about the qualities of modern life. We glimpse this in that fleeting smile which is torn from that passerby, which lingers for a moment before vanishing along the level of the roofs. Also be careful that the scene of basement kitchens and the damn souls of the housemates, once you read it once, you'll never forget it. It's like an image or like a portrait that someone painted. You can even imagine how it was like without even have to look at a picture or something. So it's like a painter who painted an image, but in words. I would also like you to take a look at the themes here, and it's mainly poverty. Here the poem presents a very human picture of poor people in the city slum, and the city slum means like in the very, very, very poor areas in the city. All right, and also here there are th some themes, themes of poverty, depression, misery, and squalor in the slums, and definitely with poverty comes depression and distress. This poem is a very excellent representation of the chaos and fragmentation that emerged in the modern world after World War I had ended. And definitely the aftermath of the war is very obvious and tangible when it comes to looking at the poor people's conditions. The tone of the poem is developed through diction, imagery, and metaphor. The speaker could be Eliot himself or a character that Eliot has created. It's not even mentioned here. However, we know this because the person has a window and therefore does not live in a basement. So it's like someone who's just taking a look at things that are taking place around him. The window may be symbolic of a wall, much like the Iron Curtain in Germany, separating reality from fantasy and social classes. Let's also not forget that the poem shows a lot of despair because the speaker mentions that the passerby has tears in his eyes and another one wants to smile but actually fails to smile. And he also criticizes the modern world through showing the characteristics that happened in, after World War I, like air pollution, for example. So it's like they're living in a place that they cannot even have any kind of facilities, even air is polluted and they're not breathing well because of the circumstances that they are facing. The diction used here in the poem is very important, very significant. He uses verbs like sprouting and it gives an image of the housemaids appearing out of nowhere, 
the word despondently clearly evokes to the reader that these people are immensely depressed with their life and haunted by the feeling of being trapped in their situations, seeing no escape from their repetitive and unfulfilling lifestyles. The stanza, the first stanza, has dramatic powerful imagery of melancholic people appearing on the street preparing for another miserable and lifeless day. And at the start of the second stanza, Eliot says, brown waves given a sense of unhygienic and polluted air because we associate the color brown as a dirty, dull color. The word fog is symbolic of confusion. And then Eliot personifies the fog by using the verb toss, therefore giving it human-like qualities and actions to show how powerful it is. In the second stanza, the word waves are a metaphor for the fog that carries the images of faces down below up to the speaker at his window. And the subject to which the word tear refers is the brown waves, definitely. In the last stanza, the smile ex is exposed to the society and then reaches above the rooftops and disappears into nothingness. And this is very significant because it shows that there is no hope at all. Whenever people even have just some glimpses of hope, they turn into nothing. Make sure you look at the alliteration in breakfast, basement, uh, souls, sprouting, and the assonance in am, and aware. Eliot uses many poetic devices in this poem, and you'll find many connotations of the morning and the basement. So everything, the diction here, is related to each other. There is some kind of coherence and cohesion. And there is onomatopoeia as well when referring to the rattling. So here he wants you to hear something. And lastly, there is a metaphor of the working classes by referring to them all or the women in the working classes as housemates. So it's like they don't have any other chance other than becoming housemates. They don't have any dreams of becoming anything higher in society because they are trapped in this forever. Here is our last poem today. It's called Fire and Eyes by the genius Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. This is a very nice poem poem and maybe you'll guess that here he's talking about the end of the world or like the universe collapsing. It has a very light and conversational tone, that's true. But Fire and Ice, this poem is a bleak poem that highlights human beings' talent for self-destruction. So it's not just only about the end of the world, no, because you have an inner world as well. So you could be destroying your inner world, which is destroying yourself. The poem is a work of writing uh, about the end of the world and poses two possible causes for this end, either fire and ice. The speaker uses these natural elements as symbols for desire and hatred, respectively, arguing that both emotions, left unchecked, have the capacity to destroy civilization itself. In other words, whether people think the world is ending in fire or in ice, whether this or that, the world will end and it's going to end tragically. Fire stands for desire or, or maybe like for bloodshed, anger, wars, and so on. And ice is something completely paradoxical and different, which is like the Cold War, things that we're facing maybe nowadays, like people being so indifferent. There is some kind of um, laziness or idleness in the world, no actions being taken. So this will end up in disasters as well. So if we are not going to take care of this, then the world will definitely end, either in fire or in ice. And this is also symbolic of the wars that we are fighting within ourselves. 
Ice and fire, though utterly different in the literal sense, here represent one and the same thing, the destructive potential of humanity. Either method will suffice to bring about the inevitable end of the world. In just nine short lines, then fire and ice, the poem offers a powerful warning about human nature. Finally, it's important to notice something that isn't in the poem. Any hint of a possibility that humanity won't end the world. I think that's more than enough for today. Make sure to ask me any questions that you would love to get answers for and I'll make sure I'll answer all of them. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed this. Have a good day and stay safe.